thanks to all of you for coming. Let me tell you a story that will help put me in context. I'm Mark Jeffrey, professor at the Kellogg School of Management, director of our uh, technology initiatives in the Center for Research and Technology Innovation. But last summer, it turns out, I went to buy a pair of sunglasses. Can you ever do this? You kind of put the pair of sunglasses on, and in the mirror, you're kind of checking yourself out, right? And so I'm driving home, and it turns out I have a convertible, and it was a really nice sunny day in Chicago. It's kind of unusual, blue skies, not too hot. And I'm driving along, you know, and the wind is blowing, and I'm feeling good, right? And I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm checking myself out, driving the car, you know, looking good, feeling good. <laughs> and I happen to be driving by a big yellow school bus. And I'm thinking, man, I'm looking good here. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I got hit in the head. <laughs> For those of you interested, it was a peanut butter Ritz cracker. <laughs> but this got me thinking about life. Isn't life like that? You're driving along, you're feeling good, you're looking good, and suddenly, out of nowhere, you get hit in the head. By the way, I realized realize, uh, a year ago, last October, we all got hit in the head by the financial crisis. I remember meeting with a Fortune 500 chief marketing officer shortly after the uh, fall of Bear Stearns. And he asked me to come in and talk about marketing metrics, but I wanted to understand what is it that really was bothering him. And I said, so, you know, what's, what's keeping you up at night? He said, well, Mark, I'll tell you the truth. I talked to the chairman yesterday, and he wants to cut my budget by 36%. This is a Fortune 500 company. This is a multi-hundred million dollar marketing budget. It's going to take a 36% hit. He said to me, Mark, you know, yesterday I, I thought it was a joke, but today I realize he's not kidding. Now, this chief marketing officer is not alone. These are very, very difficult times. So my research, teaching, and the consulting I do is all about actually making sure, ideally, you don't get hit in the head. And then if you do, you minimize the pain and the impact. Now beyond that, when we think about marketing, I want to think about how can we radically improve performance so that we do more for less. That's the fundamental theme. So here's what I'm going to share with you in the next uh, hour. I'll motivate why data-driven marketing. I'll share with you some new research. It's Kellogg Research, a study of 250 firms capturing some $53 billion worth of annual marketing spending. Insights from the research. I'll give you a quick example just to show you, okay, this is what data-driven marketing looks like. And then quickly go through a framework so you can say, okay, this is how I create a data-driven marketing strategy for my organization. Then I want to define the 15 essential metrics. We'll just go uh, present, present these rather quickly. So frankly, in an hour, we don't have time to go through all of them in detail. But what I want to do is move to case examples. I want to give you examples where I hit the high points of several of the metrics. And for sure, I want to talk at the end about the internet metrics, and in particular, the idea of agile marketing. Designing flexibility and agility into your marketing campaigns and I've seen factors of five, factors of 10 performance gains when you start to apply these data-driven marketing principles. So this is the plan. Now, Kellogg is a very cool place. I get to meet a lot of very senior executives, marketing executives, and by and large, this is what they tell me. This is the chief marketing officer right here. <laughs> This is the CEO. This is the board in the background. <laughs> and the CEO is asking, what's the value? Show me the money. What's, what's the ROI that I get from all of these hundreds, or it could be tens, hundreds, or in Microsoft's case, say the $5.5 billion a year they spend on marketing? What's the value? What is, what's the money I get from that? 
I remember talking with a very senior marketing executive, and he said to me, Mark, <coughs> every week I have to go to a gunfight. That gunfight is the senior executive leadership meeting. I'm tired of going to that gunfight carrying only a knife. What he meant was he didn't have data, he didn't have facts, so he couldn't answer really, really hard questions. So I started out by doing some research to really understand best practices for strategic marketing ROI of marketing performance, and I interviewed uh, chief marketing officers, senior marketing executives at, at these companies and others. And one of the conversations really struck me. It was a conversation with Barry Judge, the chief marketing officer at Best Buy. And this conversation was now a couple of years ago, although I've kept in touch with Barry since. And I remember asking Barry, I said, who's your number one competitor? Who do you think he said two years ago? Circuit City. Somebody said Walmart, right? I thought he was going to say Circuit City. He said Walmart. Now, the answer, Walmart, not surprising. Number one, retail, retail chain, right? Uh, I heard uh, some fact that 5% or so of the gross domestic product of China is on a Walmart shelf. Uh, it's a very big operation, and it's fundamentally transformed retail uh, throughout the world. But I was curious. I thought he was going to say Circuit City, so I asked him, why didn't you say Circuit City? And he said something very provocative. He said, because they don't get it. Wow, that's interesting. What don't they get? He said, well, what they do is they're constantly spending their marketing dollars running sales. That gets people to come into the store. But the margins in retail are really thin. Because they're so thin, it means actually when you run a sale, you lose money on a profitability basis. He says, so constantly running sales to drive revenues is a losing proposition. In his words, it's a death spiral. And of course, now the Circuit City story is history. They are bankrupt and liquidated in January of this year. And oh, by the way, throughout mid-tier retail in the United States, You've seen mass consolidation, uh, Marshall Fields in <laughs> Chicago, uh, John Wonemakers in Philadelphia. Now we're all consolidated under the Macy's brand. They can't compete on a profitability basis. So I asked Barry, I said, well, what does Best Buy do that's different? And he said, well, for sure we spend money on demand generation marketing, running sales, getting people to come to the stores. But we spend more money on branding we spend more money on customer equity. We spend more money on infrastructure to support data-driven marketing. And so this, to me, became an insight. It was the germ of a hypothesis that there's this marketing divide. There's a group of organizations that get marketing, and then there's everybody else. And so in the research, I surveyed these organizations, and here's just one of the insights that came out of, out of the research. This is a study of 253 firms. Uh, average marketing spending of these firms was around $222 million. The total data set captured some $53 billion worth of annual marketing spend. So from a nerdy academic perspective, it's a great data set. So I'm very excited about that. And here's an insight. One of the insights is I asked the, the, the respondents who are primarily chief marketing officers, I said, how do you spend your marketing dollars? And by the way, if you traditionally ask that question, you traditionally hear, well, we spend X on TV, Y on print, we do, this is internet. And my perspective, though, is that that taxonomy is not useful because it doesn't tell you anything about what the marketing was supposed to, supposed to actually do. So I, I changed the question. I said, how much money do you spend in these buckets? Demand generation marketing. Marketing, running sales to get the customer to come to the store now. Branding, customer equity, infrastructure, and shaping markets. Think of this as analyst relations if you're in B2B. 
or it could be influencing bloggers online and in B2C, that kind of thing, right, to shape the market and influence the market. What's interesting is this is the average of the 250-some responses. You see that about 50% goes to demand generation. That's intriguing. <coughs> you know why? One of the biggest challenges you hear about marketing and data-driven marketing and analysis and all this stuff is that there's a time delay between the marketing and the action. And because of that, you can't really use financial metrics to quantify marketing. But by the way, demand generation is I'm going to run a sale. 25% off, act by December 15th. Bang. They cash in the coupon, they come to the sale, you get the cash. What am I saying? I'm saying that 50% of the time, at least, you can use financial metrics for market price. And the other 50% of the time, you're going to use non-financial metrics, right? But that's an insight. Here's another insight. This is the difference between the leaders and the laggards and how they spend their marketing dollars. And you see that these are the, the laggards. 58% goes to the management generation. Uh, the, 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 uh, so there's the la laggards. Here's the leaders, 10% less. So these, these are spending, by the way, 20% more than the average uh, marketing overall, of which 48% is going to demand generation. You see that they're spending more on branding, customer equity, and a lot more on infrastructure. This is evidence that suggests that that marketing divide is real. And what we find from very detailed quantitative analysis, some structural equation modeling, and so forth, is that these organizations at the highest level, they've got better sales growth, they get better return on assets, they got better long-term shareholder equity, they get better brand equity compared to competitors. My, my point is that good things happen when you optimally uh, spend your marketing dollars and optimally manage them. So, here's a few more insights from the research. 50% don't use forecasts or campaign ROI. 60% don't use business cases. 60% don't have a defined and documented process to screen, evaluate, and prioritize marketing campaigns. 70% don't use experiments. You get the idea. You know what this tells me? It tells me that the vast majority of marketing organizations don't keep score. Why do you think that is? What do you think? Why might they not keep score? Because it's hard. Because it's hard. Yeah? What else? Traditionally, they haven't had to. They haven't had to? Yeah? They don't want to know. Yeah. You know what? I think really that's it, right? You don't really want to know. Because if we don't keep score, everybody's a winner, right? Now, what's interesting to me is if you look at the, those that are the leaders, which it turns out is less than about 20% of all the companies of 250 we, sa we sampled, they very rigorously keep score they measure. And they also have a feedback learning cycle as they're investing, they're running their campaigns, they're measuring, and they're feeding it back into this process, right? Now, I start to talk about process, and we naturally kind of start to move into this, well, this technology to support the process. We see that 60% of organizations roughly don't use a centralized database. 70% don't use enterprise data warehouse. Uh, don't use analytics. Uh, 80% don't do automated event-driven marketing, these kinds of things, right? And so my point is these data suggest in very stark contrast this idea of a marketing divide, that there's a small group of organizations that get marketing and there's everybody else. And the difference between the two groups actually comes down to marketing process. Now, when I say that, a lot of marketers sometimes have a strong reaction and they say but mark wait marketing is creative if you start to put process on marketing you're going to stifle the creativity so i asked <coughs> a question in the research i asked do you outsource the creative 
And you know what? 72% said yes. <coughs> My point is this, that the vast majority of marketing organizations outsource the creative component of the market. So my argument is that, yeah, absolutely, marketing is creative. But what most marketers do is manage the process of marketing. Okay, Make sense? So let me give you an example. What does data-driven marketing look like? How would you know it if you saw it? Here's an example. This is from Land's End. The power of 10. The 10 key new pieces for your perfect spring wardrobe. Who is this marketing for? Give me a hand. Is it, is it for you? Doesn't look like it. Probably not. Who's it for? Come on, you gotta, you gotta help me out here a little bit. What do you think? Who's it for? It's for you. Is it really for you, though? No, oh, it's for your mom. By the way, that's very different. Uh, why did you say it's for your mom? It's really not for you. Uh, she's an older, more conservative. Yeah. How old is she? 45. <laughs> Usually the guys are like, man, she's looking pretty good. <laughs> right? But ladies, why do we know she's like 40? Somebody knows. Somebody sees it. Wrinkles, wrinkles. Yeah, you, the ladies are all seeing it, man. They're right there, right? So, yeah, she's about 40. Power of 10, 10 perfect things. Turns out you could, you could, you know, why do you need the 10 perfect things? Mix and match, right? If you have 10 things, you, you can mix and match them. Uh, the idea being maybe you're really, really busy. Right? So you're really busy, you mix and match, I just buy 10 things, I'm good to go. It turns out if you were to open this magazine up, you would see actually it's fairly expensive, <laughs> right? So the, the first couple of pages, the average price is around $50 to $100, which for land end is kind of, kind of unusual. So this implies that this is targeted more at an affluent uh, type of a person. So perhaps a professional woman who's working, but what's this? Men's XXL and more. You go to the back of the catalog, there's men's clothes. What's up with that? Uh, trying to save money. Save money, maybe. Yeah, yeah when you're, I'm married for like 19 years. It's like I have a professional fashion consultant on my staff, okay? In fact, a couple of years ago, we got so busy my wife's a professor in the engineering school. So we actually, we got a couple of kids. So I actually, when I started to buy my own clothes, very dangerous thing. And I remember, and I've told this story, by the way, in, in Asia, South America, Europe, uh, obviously here in the United States, and apparently it crosses boundaries. <laughs> but it turns out I bought this new suit. I was really, really happy with it. And apparently in every culture, when the man, the married man goes and buys new clothes, Shortly thereafter, there is a fashion show that takes place in the bedroom. It doesn't matter where you are, what culture you're in, it happens. So I come out in the bedroom, right? I'm all happy with myself. And my wife goes, what were you thinking? <laughs> I'm like, what? I really like this suit. And it turns out it was one of those suits that has no pleats in the pants. She's like, you've got short legs and a fat ass. It's just not going to work. <laughs> My point at the end of the day, though, is that this is an example of data-driven marketing. <coughs> this came to my house. It came to my wife. She's very, very busy. We're sitting on the couch. She looked at this, and she said, wow, this is exactly what I need. And she looked through it, and she said, wow, I don't like this. I like that. I don't like that, but I like this. She didn't pick up the phone to order right then. But within a week, she did pick up the phone and she did order. It was no accident that this marketing came to my house. It turns out she was 40 years old, as I was at the time it showed up. 
we have a couple of kids. There's kids stuff. There's, there's men stuff in the back. You know, it's targeting a fairly affluent demographic, right? By the way, this is interesting. This is what they sent to me. <laughs> no, I didn't buy. By the way, who owns Land's End? Sears. Okay. So the example I just gave you was for the Land's End catalog. I actually have data from back in 2001 for <coughs> Sears. This is before it was taken over by Lambert. Uh, but the data is for the Sears catalog that's designed to get you into the store. Very similar, think of <laughs> thin 20 page flyer, but the same kinds of ideas, right? But now this, this, the data I'm gonna show you is to get you to come into the store. So 250 different mailers, 14, 18 million customers spread over 18 separate mailings, generating $900 million a year, kind of a lot. Let's think about this. What do you know about the profitability of this marketing campaign? Anybody? What's that? Okay, so you had a wild guess. All right. Well, let me ask you this. How much do you think it costs to print and mail a catalog? Roughly. Guessing is good. $5. Five dollars. Okay, I think that's high. It's bulk, right? So you got millions of them. So let's say it's about a dollar. So how much does this marketing campaign cost? Two hundred and fifty million dollars. Two hundred and fifty million to get nine hundred million in revenues. Is this a good deal? No. Why? Because the margins in retail are less than ten percent. That means that conservatively, you're losing a hundred million dollars on this marketing. Campaign. the idea it's doing marketing but it's not it's driving revenues but it's not profitable it's not profitable revenues and by the way the series executives clued into this right it's not driving ROI it's not meeting the company's expectations so the new strategy we're going to segment the market and of course market segmentation is a very old idea you've all read Phil Kotler's famous marketing book as you read that book by the way you notice that pretty much all the problems in it have three segments. There's a high value, medium, and low value. And I think part of the reason for that is the book is like 20 years old. You know, 20 years ago, it was really, really hard to do segmentation. But today, though, it's different. We have enterprise data warehouse technology, analytics, and so forth. Segmentation now is much easier. So the, what did they do? 25 distinct segments. We're now going to version the mailers. So for example, there's a version for 40 year old uh, woman, professional, head of household with husband and kids, okay? What happens? <coughs> Increase in mailer revenue of $215 million a year. Is that a little bit or a lot? That's a lot. I just took a 900 million marketing campaign. I made it a 1.1 billion marketing campaign. Oh, by the way, what I love about this is the data-driven marketing. Check it out. Look at the metrics. 1% improvement in number of trips generated. People come more. 5% improvement in average purchase dollars. People spend more. 2% in improvement in gross margins. Is that a little bit or a lot? That's a lot. This is retail. This is a lot. Let me give you another example as to why that is. Lowe's Hardware. Lowe's Hardware back in uh, around 1990 was a chain of about 140 some mid-sized hardware stores down in the southern part of the United States. And they saw a competitor coming. By the way, they do not utter the competitor's name in their headquarters. They call them Agent Orange. <laughs> so they saw Agent Orange coming, Home Depot. And they realize that if they don't fundamentally change their business model, Home Depot is going to own the market and they're going to be out of business. So around 1990, Lowe's sold off all of their mid-sized hardware stores, all 140, and started to build big box stores. This is a gutsy move. 
Today, by the way, Lowe's is number 44 on the Fortune 100 and is, is quite a performing, high performing company. Part of what they do is when you come into the hardware store, they want to have the philosophy is like, it's like going to the corner hardware store in terms of service. So for example, you come in to build a deck, they're going to help you pick out the lumber, the bolts, design the deck, they'll help you load your truck or they'll have it delivered to you, and so forth. Now what do you think though, there's a high probability somebody will purchase shortly after building a deck on their house? What do you think? Chairs. Chairs. Grill. Well, it turns out, depending on the size of the deck, the chairs and you know, the furniture may or may not fit, but the American male will always find room for the grill. <laughs> so there is a high probability that you'll purchase a grill. Again, data-driven marketing. I'm looking at all of the customer purchases. I'm going to find those that came in and were, were looking to buy a deck couple of weeks after, I'm going to send them a flyer in the mail. That flyer is all about grills, okay? The reaction is, wow, that's exactly what I need. Now, is it 100% certain they're going to come back to Lowe's and buy the grill? Absolutely not. But there is a higher percentage probability that they will return to Lowe's versus going to Agent Orange or or wherever they might go. They could go to Walmart, the grocery store, what have you. This is the essence of data-driven marketing and using analytics to drive performance. And as we'll see, the performance gains you get are huge. So let me give you just a quick framework for thinking about data-driven marketing strategy. It starts with knowing yourself. What are the objectives? Create a database. Uh, know your customers, you're going to do the analysis. Typically then you're going to segment your customers, do some targeting. Now you do your data-driven marketing. Privacy, privacy, privacy issues are incredibly important. We have to think those through, what it means. And finally, we have to keep score and have metrics for measurement. You know, sometimes when I show this, folks say, well, privacy is so important. You know, you've got to put that at the top. So you put it wherever you want. But I have a provocative statement. At least in the United States, a person's privacy is as cheap as the cost of a t-shirt. Now, what do I mean by that? A free t-shirt, people will tell you, they'll give you their names, they'll sign up for stuff, right? <laughs> but my point is, there's a value proposition. So if you want to get a customer's data, you have to have a value proposition. You can't just say, give me your data. No, you have to explain why, right? So I'm guessing that most of you have in your wallets one of those cards to go to the grocery store. Maybe, maybe not with this audience, but most audiences would have a card in their, their pocket. Why would you have that grocery store card? Yeah, to get the discount, right? To get the sale. Is it on sale? No, no. But they mark it up. So, yeah. My point is mark up, not marked up. Oh, I think I'll take the not mark up, please. Very crystal clear value proposition. You're giving your data to the grocery store chain in turn for getting discounts on certain products. They get the information, and prim <coughs> primarily, by the way, use that inf information to reduce inventory when they, when they have a large quantity of, of certain, certain products. And what I want to focus on primarily, though, is the metrics piece, the keeping score, because really doing just a few very simple things, you can deliver profound performance gains to your marketing campaigns. So let me define the 15 essential metrics. I'll do this rather quickly. And then let's move in. I'll give you some examples of how you actually do it. So here's the first 10. I call these the classical marketing metrics. The first four are the essential non-financial metrics. We've got brand awareness, test drive churn, and customer satisfaction. Take rate, the key operations metric, that's just the percent of customers that accept your offer. 
Then we've got the four sort of key financial metrics, essential metrics, profit, net present value, return rate, return payback, and then the essential value-based marketing metric, customer lifetime value. So these are the essential 10 classical marketing metrics. And of course, today, the internet is everywhere, right? So if we didn't have internet and network metrics, that would be a gap. So here's the five key internet metrics that I define. The first three are really about optimizing search. It turns out that 49% of internet marketing budgets go to search engine marketing. And to optimize search, you need cost per click, transaction conversion rate, return on ad dollar spend. Bounce rate, this is about how good your website. That's the fraction of customer people that come to your website and leave within five seconds. If your bounce rate is very high, that means your website is no good. Okay? So you could have great internet marketing that drives people to your website. So you've got great click-through rate, right? But the problem is that the bounce rate is really, really high. That means they're clicking through, but when they when they get there, they're just not, it's just not interesting. It's not working, right? So it gives you a hint on what to do. And then finally, I define word of mouth, and I'll give you an example later in the session which is a key essential social media marketing metric, word of mouth and social media. So just to give you a framework, how does it work? How do you apply this? Because, I mean, I remember engaging with one organization. They had 50 metrics on their scorecard. And they collected data for those 50 every month. But my problem was they were just paralyzed. They just had too much data. So my perspective is, instead of taking 50 metrics, let's focus on 15 and do those really well. And I'm going to share with you how you dramatically improve your marketing by just focusing on these 15 metrics. So the idea is, here's a framework. We want to take our customers through awareness, evaluation, trial, and loyalty. Trial, by the way, this is more that demand generation marketing stuff. Come buy my stuff, right? Loyalty is now repeat purchases. Awareness, this is branding. And evaluation, this is where I'm going to see if I really want to buy this or not, compare it with other products and so forth, right? What are the key metrics? Well, obviously, brand awareness for awareness. Here at the test drive. Test drive is absolutely essential. I'll give you an example of that. Trial, this is demand generation marketing. This is the financial metrics. Marketing is designed to get this customer to come to the store, buy the product, whatever it is. I can use financial metrics for that. And remember we talked about earlier that this works 50% of the time. For loyalty, the key metric is churn. That's the percent of customers that choose not to do business with you. Usually measured in a year, 90 days, or 30 days. And this is the what I call the golden marketing metric, customer satisfaction. Customer sat is intimately connected to loyalty and awareness since most companies are established companies. They already have products in place. Most companies do. And because of that, your future purchases are heavily influenced by your past experiences. So satisfaction is essential. Then we've got the operations metric and the, and the value-based marketing metric. And where you lay on top of the, the internet metrics, by the way, are predominantly right here. Because you know what? It's search, click, buy. Right? It's, it happens pretty fast. Uh, word of mouth, though, in social media is customer satisfaction. It's another measure of customer sat. Okay? So let me give you some examples. So here's an ad. Let's do branding first. pretty hot, huh? 
<laughs> so, what was the demographic target for that? I'm just guessing. Just, just guess what. Who's the target? Five males. What's that? 18 to 25. You got males. it exactly. Young males in Europe. Okay, in the Netherlands. So it turns out that there is a perception that a blade razor is a closer shave than an electric razor. And so the most young men prefer a blade. Now it turns out the research shows that there's absolutely no difference. But this is one of those examples of where perception is reality. So the idea here was Philips is the number one electric shaver manufacturer. They wanted to do a brand campaign to change that younger demographic and influence them towards buying electric shavers. So what's the ROI of this? Well, this is where I have to say it's a branding campaign. There is no quote unquote financial ROI. It's the wrong metric. But what we want to look at is the idea of brand awareness. Brand awareness is a leading indicator of future sales. If, you, if your awareness is going down, your future sales are most likely going to go down. If it starts going up, your sales should start going up. So it's a leading indicator. So you ask questions like, you know, have you seen, seen you know, ads and so forth? But what's really, so there's unaided, there's aided recognition. The biggest reason that brand advertising fails is because people see the ad and they maybe laugh at it, they're engaged by the ad, so they remember I saw an ad, but they have no clue what the heck the product is for. So what's interesting about this campaign is that first, let's look at pre-post change. They're going to measure, and this is product awareness, and they're also asking purchase intent. So as they're in that circle, they're asking qualitatively, you know, hey, are you aware? B, would you purchase, right? And you're seeing that the needle moved. Now, this is only in, it's like in two months, around Christmas season last year. So it's relatively small, and you say, yeah, it's, it's all right, but it's not great. But what's really cool about this marketing is the way they now went through an optimization of the brand marketing. And the idea is, through that survey, we're going to ask brand awareness versus recognition of the touch point. So did you, did A, have you seen it? And B, if, you, if I now I show it to you, what, what, what product is this for? I'm, I'm really, what, what brand is it for? What product brand? And what you see is, these have got really good brand awareness, but for whatever reason, they're not being seen, okay? This is working extremely well. This stuff is working really well. And so the idea then is to say, well, how can I, you know, think about poker chips in your marketing game. Where do I put the poker chips? How do I move them around? I just did a trial in the Netherlands. I'm now going to blow this out over Europe. How can I redesign this marketing campaign to get better bang for the buck? And indeed that they did that. Let me give you a different example. What this is, it's simulating the sunglass purchasing experience. It's a virtual test drive on the internet. So you have a camera on your computer. You're now going to try on the glasses. So you're going to, now it's got your, your face, right? You're on the computer. You're going to try them on, and it's going to show you what you look like with these different sunglasses on. It's a test drive. By the way, test drives are everywhere. Obviously, the obvious one is buying a car, but if you're going to buy an MRI scanner in a hospital, it's there. I don't want that one. Okay. If you're going to buy an MRI scanner in a hospital, there's one. If you're going to uh, purchase Intel chips and put them in your motherboard, it turns out there's a, there's a test drive. Sunglasses are just the same thing. Now, why is this important? The test drive is a leading indicator of future sales. 
And so what does Ray-Ban do? Ray-Ban actually, first of all, there's an issue with sunglasses that you've only got a, a seven-month window where people actually purchase sunglasses because when it's sunny in the summer. And it turns out from a supply chain perspective, you've only actually got two shots at it because, you know, you've got to order them and they've got to get manufactured and shipped. So what Rayvon actually does is they put the designs on the Internet several months before the launch, and then they measure the printouts uh, that people make of their final, final one that they like. So they're measuring the number of test drives and the one that you finally converge on. And that, it turns out, is a leading indicator of which sunglass designs are really going to be big this summer. So it impacts their supply chain. Now realize they've got 3 million unique users of this, of this application. It's pretty cool, right? So now the idea is brand awareness. It's a leading indicator of future revenues. Test drive for evaluative marketing is a leading indicator. So now what happens when we get down here we're going to get into loyalty. Loyalty, remember, is churn. That's the key metric. It's the percent of customers who choose not to do business with you in a year. And this is incredibly important. A lot of organizations I work with say, oh, we don't have a churn problem. And then when they measure churn, they find that, wow, 30% of our customers leave every year and they choose not to come back. What if you, instead of having 30% of customers leave, you only have 20% leave, suddenly you've got a 10% revenue hit every year. It's huge, absolutely huge. So churn reduction can have a fundamental impact on the business. Let me give you an example. I realize this is an eye chart. This is from uh, Earthlink. What this is, this is called a decision tree. This is the output of SaaS Enterprise Data Miner. But the idea is that you have a database, right? The database is collecting information on your customers, and it's tracking interactions of your customers with your call centers and so forth, right? Earthlink, it turns out, sells a, a broadband and dial-up internet access primarily to rural communities. That's where they, they have their, their niche. And what this is, this is a decision tree. It's saying, well, I click the button in Enterprise Data Miner. This thing just comes out, OK? It's saying that 94% of my customers don't churn, but five do. 5% do churn in like 90 days or something, or whatever it is in a year. Okay, I don't know what the exact number is, or how long it is. But here's the deal. Now the customer calls up. And the customer calls up and says, excuse me, am I serviceable for broadband? Because they got like dial-up right now. Am I serviceable? So if they call up, they're over here. If they don't call up, they're over there. Do you see that those that call up, their churn rate is 12.6%, where the population is 5%? These have twice as much chance of churning compared to the population. This next split then is how much do you use it? Well, in a way, it's stating the obvious. You see the low users have a 17.5% <coughs> churn rate. Wow. What does this mean? What this means is Earthlink <coughs> runs this kind of model every day. They're looking for their customers. They're looking for customers at a high probability of churn, and they send them targeted marketing offers. The marketing offer could be dedicated help for you, so you need help using it. It could be, well, clearly you called up for broadband to ask if you're qualified, let me give you an offer for broadband. Or it could be, you know what, you're not really, if I could increase your usage, your churn is going to go down. Let me send you a $5 or $10 gift card, surprise and delight for Starbucks, have a coffee on us. Wow, that, I like that. I'll start using my, my, uh, my uh, Earthlink more. What happens? Very impressive, 30% reduction in churn, 20 times, 20x improvement in profitability of these customers over their lifetime. It's phenomenal. Realize that this is a lot more than tens of millions of dollars. It's a lot. This is a big impact. 
By the way, this is the, just an example. There are several types of analysis. But when we talk about you know, the Lowe's example, customers that buy a deck also you know, buy a grill type thing, it's the same kinds of things that you're going to do, this kind of analysis. I mentioned earlier customer sat is a leading indicator of future revenues. And the key question is, would you recommend to a friend or colleague? Let me just give you a quick example. Ladies, you're going to know this one, right? DSW? What's DSW? Discount shoes. Discount shoes. But is it like uh, really poor shoes? Not very good shoes? No, it's excellent brand name shoes, right? It is Cole Haan. It is, you know, all the, all the good shoes, right? The good stuff. So it turns out that DSW has the highest customer sat of any shoe re retailer. 37% of DSW customers would highly recommend. 68% of advisor customers are highly satisfied. But look at this. This is share of spending in the past four months share of spending in the next four months. You see that the share of spending in the next four months is bigger. My point is this, highly satisfied customers will spend more in the future. The satisfied customers will spend less. It is a leading indicator of future revenue. So now, as we've actually done that circle, the marketing cycle, if you will, We've actually covered all the metrics that are pretty much leading indicators of future revenues. Let's look at the other 50% that is the financial metric. So here's an example. I was asked by DuPont to think about what's the value of that, okay? That logo, that little logo right there is a sponsor Formula One. I know it's, by the way, it's not even on a car. It's like a little thing on the side there. So what's the value of that? And it's really intriguing as you get into sports marketing and sports sponsorship. It's not how much you spend on the sponsorship that counts. It's how you activate the sponsorship that counts. It turns out that there's a person that uh, drives the BMW car, at least until recently where he did. This is him right here. Oh. Emoții savana cu teflon. Am trimis trei coduri și am câștigat un aparat foto. Și cu excursie la marele premiu de Formula 1 al Belgiei plus banii de buzunar. Și tu poți câștiga savana, formula numărul 1 cu teflon în România. So, who is that? Anybody know? Anybody know who that is? No. Why didn't it come up? I don't know why it didn't come up. I've lost my presentation. Turns out his name is Kavika. I guess there's no big fans of Formula One. Okay. Uh, anybody know what language he was speaking? No? Romanian. How'd you know that? <laughs> oh, is it Romanian on there? He's like, oh, man. I went to Kellogg. I knew that. Okay, so absolutely right. By the way, I did this for the Olympic Committee uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, people there, they actually know he's speaking Romanian. So it turns out he's not from Romania. He's actually from Poland. He speaks Polish. But they got him in ads for this uh, company. Uh, say, realize, by the way, DuPont is a business-to-business -business company, and they're going to do uh, distribution of their paint through a sort of the Romanian uh, Home Depot stores, if you will, with the paint manufacturer. So check it out. They do these ads. You see the sales increase by 100%. Acrylic enamels by 1,000%, wood gloss by 100%. My point is really, really good things happen when you do this. You can measure this. You can show the value. You can quantify it in hard dollars. They did that. And actually, this is what it looks like if you blow this out in terms of a three-year marketing program with different campaigns in each year. This is then a financial ROI. I'm going to call it a return on marketing investment, a Romy analysis where now we've got the different campaigns in each year, and then the three-year marketing program. Here's the total costs. 
here's the uh, total profit here, here's the net difference, you get an internal rate of return, you get a net present value, you get a payback, NPV greater than zero, good, internal rate of return greater than R, good, R for manufacturing companies typically about 12%. So my point is this is a very good internal rate of return marketing initiative. And think again, it's your casino game, right? You got your marketing chips. Where do I put the chips? Well, maybe I should put some more on this one. Okay, you get the idea. So this is how you do financial return on marketing investment. There's a lot more examples uh, in the book if you're interested. So let me just close out the session with just a word about the new age internet marketing metrics. And a key one today, I mean, social media, explosion of social media is just, just amazing. Um, word of mouth on the internet. Only very recently in the last several months has it become possible to actually measure this, which is really quite intriguing to me. And so I define word of mouth as a number of direct clicks plus the number of clicks from recommendations divided by the number of direct clicks. And you're like, well, so what? Well, it turns out you can actually track through, there's companies out there, one of them being called, Meet, that is called Meet Your Solutions. You can actually track sharing on the internet, okay? And so somebody sees an ad, you see the ad, and then share it to their friends through Facebook, uh, email, whatever it might be. In this case, it's the Santa Gon Centro campaign. The friends come visit, and then they share, right? And it turns out you can track this down to you can track unique users and how much sharing they're doing. You can, you can track groups of users, domains, and that kind of stuff, right? Very, very, very powerful. Now, just a few comments about social media marketing. Social media marketing doesn't mean that traditional marketing is dead. You have to seed social media with traditional marketing. You've got to tell them, hey, I got this cool Santa Gon Centro thing, right? You got to come check it out. So there has to be traditional media. And by the way, you know, I heard somewhere that Ashton Kutcher has more followers on Twitter than there are countries. Uh, people who live in certain small countries. And part of the reason for that is he put humongous billboards up all around LA. Come follow me on Twitter. Okay, because he wanted to have more people follow him than Oprah or something like that, right? So my point is traditional media drives social media marketing, right? But then you have to figure out how you're going to measure it. And you've got to track it. And by the way, when to do sharing, you've got to give them some incentive something cool to share, right? So you have to have all of these things in place to have a really effective social media marketing campaign. Let me give you a different example. This is Resident Evil 5, uh, this is Capcom's, uh, this is the most successful video game franchise ever, right? It's huge. And it turns out the idea is you come to the website and if you get five friends to come to the website and see the video, you unlock exclusive content, which now they, they put these very professional movie, you know, grade uh, vignette videos together that you can now come and see as you get more and more of your friends to see them and they get more of their friends to see them and so forth. What happens? This is the idea, these are the direct clicks. This is how you would rank websites if you were looking at high to low direct clicks. Realize that this is with the recommendations, and here's that word of mouth metric calculated over here. The idea being the word of mouth is direct plus recommendations divided by the direct clicks. What happens? You see that these websites are delivering significantly more traffic than the traditional marketing direct stuff. But if you didn't measure this, you wouldn't know, right? I, I like to call the word of mouth metric the social media multiplier. See here, for example, Xbox 360 has got a uh, word of mouth multiplier of 21. What does that mean? It means one impression for Xbox 360 actually is worth 21 because it's being shared with 21 people. 
pretty powerful stuff, right? Pretty powerful stuff. But my point is that technology today means that you can measure this. It's incredibly cool. Well, here's the last insight I want to give you, and that is around agile marketing. Now, let's think about a traditional marketing campaign. Uh, one organization I work with, they did this $35 million ad buy. Turns out that uh, the date was set way in advance. Fired the campaign off, away it went, but there was some glitches, the website really wasn't ready. Yeah, well, you know, it sort of really didn't work, but uh, since we didn't really measure anything, it was a success. It was great, right? It was really, really good. All right, next campaign. <coughs> so my point is that's traditional uh, marketing. Let me show you one that's different. This is uh, from Microsoft. This is their uh, security guidance a center. There's this perception issue a few years ago that Microsoft has security issues. So what they found was if they can do in-person trainings of Microsoft uh, uh, IT professionals, not Microsoft people, but IT professionals in enterprises, if they can do that, then it dramatically improves their perception pre and post as to the security of Microsoft products, it turns out. Okay? Well, I know this is an eye chart. Does that look like an eye chart? But I love this. I know, I'm such a nerd. Look at it. It's data. But get this. It's, it's one Excel spreadsheet tracking a $17.5 million marketing campaign. One Excel spreadsheet. Notice they've got all the different media, direct mail, uh, web placements, a newsletter, impressions. They're tracking everything. Okay? It all comes down to the bottom line, how many people signed up for those in-person trainings. This is weekly data, weekly data. You know what the marketers saw when they looked at this? Because they, they didn't have all this stuff. They just looked at the first week. They saw that number, 439. They said, oh my goodness me. If we keep doing what we're doing, this is going to be a disaster. It's not going to work. They saw this at the end of the first week. What I love about this example is that by the end of the second week, they changed the campaign. What happens, you go from 439, 250, it jumps up. 750, 1200, 1500, 1700, and then it, it keeps going. And it turns out over the life of the campaign, this delivered a six times performance improvement had they just kept it the same. My point is this. You have to design your marketing campaigns to be measured. And if you're going to fail, fail fast. In this case, they're collecting data on a weekly basis and at the end of the first week, they realized it wasn't working. So that by the end of the second week, they changed the campaign. That's agile marketing. And I realized that the average marketing campaign, we collect data at the beginning, maybe. Just maybe there's some ROI. Maybe there's something a month or two after. But there's usually nothing in between. This is different. Now, I often hear you need real-time data. I'm going to argue you don't need real-time data. What you need is near-time data. You need to collect data on a time scale that's shorter than the length of time of your campaign. Rule of thumb is about a tenth, right? So maybe it's a tenth month campaign, ten month campaign, at least once a month have some data. That means you can impact the performance of that campaign early in the campaign. In this case, we've got ten weeks of data. At the end of the first week, we can make a decision to improve the campaign. I routinely see organizations that do this get at least a factor of five times improvement in performance of their marketing. So let me just summarize. I shared with you research. The research was from 250 firms capturing some $53 billion worth of annual marketing spending. And it shows that there is a marketing divide. There is a small group of organizations that get marketing, about 20% or less, and then there's everybody else, the other 80%. But it's those 20% that have better sales growth, better return on assets, 
better long-term shareholder equity than competitors. They have better financial performance. They do better. Now, Michael Porter defines sustainable competitive advantage as the coordination of activities that's not easily duplicated. And you might look at this and say, well, Mark, you know, the things that these marketing organizations are doing, it's really not easily duplicated. I couldn't possibly do that. My point to you is that it's a simple set of things, simple set of rules, processes that they follow. And if you know those processes, you can do it as well. One of the key elements is that they measure. They keep score. You need metrics to keep score. I recommend there's just 15 essential metrics to quantify the vast majority of marketing. You then can use those metrics to define scorecards. The scorecard is a balanced scorecard with leading indicators of future revenues. And then scorecards on financial performance right now. And we showed that the research shows that 50% of marketing budgets go to demand generation marketing, which is revenue right now. That means you can use financial metrics more than 50% of the time. For the other 50%, I share with you other metrics that are the more of the leading indicators. Design your campaign so if you're going to fail, fail fast. It's this measurement combined with analytics, kind of creates the, wow, that's exactly what I need. Dramatically improves financial performance. And finally, there's a systematic approach to developing a data-driven marketing strategy. And the final takeaway is, you don't need 100% of the data to get started. With that, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. All right.